So I'm very happy to welcome you all to this event with um, Emily Pine and Sinead Gleeson. Um, my name is Rachel Andrews. Um, I'm a writer, um, a journalist, um, and I'm just going to give a short introduction to both of the writers. Um, and then we'll do some uh, talking and reading, and there'll be uh, some time for questions from the audience after as well. Um, so I'll just introduce Emily first. She is the Emily Pine. She's the author of the Emily Pine. The Emily Pine. Pine, the yeah. Emily Pine yes. <laughs> She's the author of the best-selling collection Notes to Self, published by Tramp Press. This book won the Irish Book of the Year for 2018. She's associate professor of modern drama at UCD, director of the Irish Memory Studies Research Network, and editor of the Irish University Re Review. As an academic, she's published widely in the fields of theatre and memory studies. Her book on the dynamics of witnessing memory and trauma in contemporary international theatre is forthcoming from Indiana University Press. Sinead Gleeson is the author of the essay collection Constellations, which I think might be also a number one bestseller, <laughs> we're not sure, <laughs> certainly up there. Her essays have been published in Granta, Winter Papers, Gorse, Elsewhere, A Journal of Place, Autumn, an anthology for the changing season, seasons and Banshee. Her short stories appear in Being Various, New Irish Short Stories from Faber, Repeal the Eighth, The Broken Spiral, and Looking at the Stars. And her poetry is featured in various anthologies, including Autonomy, Washing Windows, Irish Women Write Poetry, and Reading the Future. She's currently finishing a stint as the 2019 Writer in Residence at University College Dublin, She's also an editor of The Long Gays Back, an anthology of women, Irish women writers, and its successor, The Glass Shore, short stories by women from the North of Ireland. Both of these were winners at the Irish Book Awards. And in autumn 2020, Head of Zeus will publish The Art of the Glimpse, 100 Irish short stories, which is also edited by Sinead. Previously, Sinead presented the book show on RT Radio 1 for four years. She also has presented the uh, art show Front Row with BBC Radio 4, and she regularly moderates and chairs panels events. So, welcome to both writers. Um, I thought we might start just by asking you both. Both of you have written these wonderful essay collections, um, and um, they take there's overlapping themes, but there's also differences between them, and they take different forms. Um, maybe we could just start by, if you could tell me how you came to write the books, how it came about, and in terms of, I suppose, subjects or themes, how it came that they, they, you took, you, you, you found your way into these subjects. I think we're actually both quite similar in that we didn't think we were writing books at the time, and for me that would have been too terrifying. Um, but I was definitely interested in the form in that I had, a long time ago, I wrote a very short post on a website I used to have that a publisher saw, which was about dropping my daughter to, to a crash one day and I happened to be, it happened to be the 5th of January, which is the day I got a terrible diagnosis of leukemia and in front of me was a, a hearse with two, two coffins, not one. And immediately my brain was like, why is there two? What happened? A terrible accident, a fire, I don't know. And I started to kind of think about it. And just the, that was the fact that it was on that day and connected to my daughter, I just kind of... So I wrote this very short piece and a publisher approached me and said, would you like to write something? This is about eight years ago. Um, and I wrote a few... They gave me a deadline, I wrote a few chapters, they were interested. And they were very interested in it being a miserable, <laughs> moany, death-lit book. A misery um, memoir. And, I, and they were like, more death, more sickness. And I went, I'm not really interested in writing that. So, and it was a big publisher, and I, and I said no, but it was the first time I'd ever tried to write about my, my own life, um, having tried to write fiction before. So, and I realise now that lots of bits I, I wrote eventually became the first essay in this book, which is published by Granta, which is Blue Hill. So lots of it. Um, and I wasn't too sure what the essay was. And I was watching what was going on in, uh, I mean, uh, in, in the US. It's on every MA and MA, MFA. It's taught widely. We're a bit behind in the UK and Ireland on the form, even though we have a tradition and culture here, going back to Hubert Butler, of, of writing maybe more political or, or idea-based stuff. Um, but the start of it for me was, was a couple of write, writing singular pieces and not thinking that they'd be a book because they didn't think anybody would want to publish a book like this because everyone tells you publishers want novels. They don't want strange, weird books like this. Um, <laughs> so I put the first essay, and I, I was only talking about it today online, was, was, was published by Banshee, which is a great literary journal, who are about to start publishing actual books. They're publishing a debut collection of short stories. Um, 
And I sent a piece off to them again, not thinking that anything would, would happen with them. They wanted to publish it. So that was 2015. So I started to accumulate. And by the time I'd got three or four, I started, and they're all very different, the first three or four pieces. I thought, could they be a book? Are they connected? Are they a thing? What is this? Because I was very allergic to the idea of memoir um, mm -hmm. because I didn't, wasn't interested in writing just about myself. So when I had three or four, I think there was a, the agency I'm with had a, have a competition where you can write, submit. Um, they do it every couple of years, the Deborah Rogers Prize, where they're looking for a work in progress is 20 to 30,000 words. And I didn't have 20,000 words, but I was close. Um, and I entered that competition to see if there'd be any interest in nonfiction. So I got to the last eight. Um, I think that and all eight of us got, got signed by that agency, and then my, my agent went go off and write, and left me alone for a long time, which was good, because mm -hmm. if I'd felt that pressure or deadline or there's a contract waiting to be signed for a book, I, I would have actually think I'd run the other way. So being left alone, I think, is very important as a writer. I think, I think Trump did this with Emily as well. And, and sorry, just mm. before, and, and what, that, book, that essay, Hair, uh, mm. that was the one that was published in Banshee, Banshee yeah. wasn't yeah. it? So yeah. just thinking about the subjects and how you both came to think about the subjects, like why were you particularly, you know, you said you didn't quite know what you were writing about, mm. but at the same time, they, they're they subjects that are sort of coming out of your own experience. Is that fair to yeah, say? Yeah, and I, and I think uh, it's funny because the book originally was 20 essays and not 14, okay. and, and some of them I took out, and a couple of them are about nature because I'm interested in landscape and place. Um, and I have a piece in an anthology next year about nature, which is all by all women. So it, it, it's funny because pu publishers will tell you, like, what's the theme, what's the idea? I was interested in it being a bit of a grab bag, a bit of miscellany, because lots of essay collections I like are about all sorts of things. But I do think because essays are a risk, I think they're a huge risk. Um, not, maybe not so much in the last year because there's been a lot of good work coming out of Ireland. But before that, I think publishers are like, we need to be able to explain to a bookseller or a salesperson or, or all that. And unfortunately, bookselling is a business and we like to forget that horrible part of it, but it actually is true. So they want to be able to tell someone in two minutes what your book is about. So if they kind of go, it's about sewing and knitting and tiddlywinks <laughs> and sport, that doesn't sound very really appealing. So, so if there is a cohesion to it, I think it's easier to sell and, and books and they are a business. Um, okay. so, so I just had decided to take some pieces out because I, they felt that they, some had been published mainly. Um, but I think it is, uh, it's, it's finding a thematic thing is what I think publishers want you to do with books like mm. these. What, what's the subject? And, and did you think about that? Or I mean, I know, again, you were probably... I did in a sense. So how did it evolve? <laughs> um, sometimes I say that I wrote this book accidentally. Mm. And in a way, and that is something that we have in common, that you yeah. just you start doing something. And I think if you decide before you do it, then that closes it down. But if you just pretend or, or allow yourself to forget that you're doing something deliberately, then it, it builds. And so it, I, I had written the first piece is about my father and uh, and I had just kind of put it in a drawer and I wasn't going to do anything with it and then my boyfriend who is uh, a great reader and a great writer himself um, came across it and uh, said you know this is really good I think actually what he said is this is better than the other stuff you write um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, <laughs> exactly um, and then and even after that kind of words of encouragement um, it took me a while to get up the guts to send it to a publisher because I just I couldn't see this as a standalone piece. You know, I've trained for decades to be an academic and to write objectively and to write kind of important things about the world. And then here I was writing about very personal experience. And so when I sent it to Tramp Press, because they only publish fiction, and, the, and Lisa Cohen said to me, you know, we only publish fiction. I said, no, I know. That's why I'm sending it to you, because there's no chance you'll publish it. <laughs> and then they said, OK, well, we'll read it, but we're not publishing it. I was like, no, I know. <laughs> this is my get-out-of-jail-free card, right? And, uh, and then a couple of months later, they came back, and they said, would you do a book? And I said, but you don't publish nonfiction. And, uh, and they said, yeah, but we want to do a book. And, and in a little bit in the opposite way from you, Sinead, that was a really important catalyst for me, to actually look at the experience that I had written about and say, this is, people want to read this, uh, amazingly. And, uh, and although even still that fear dogged me as I was, as I was writing out, I'd come downstairs and say, nobody will want to read this. And, uh, and Ronan would say, don't worry about that. Go back upstairs, keep writing. So he's full of great advice. Um, but the, but the, something about the, the contract, something about a publisher saying, you have a voice, there are these amazing non-fiction collections by women in America that are making really big waves, and um, we think that there's a gap for kind of feminist 
personal life writing um, in Ireland, uh, and, and we'd love to do it with you. And then we, I say we did it, I mean, I wrote it, but I really kind of wrote it in correspondence with them really fast. And it's amazing how I had spent maybe years thinking about it and letting it percolate in the back of my head. And then there's that moment where you get permission and you just think, right, okay, I'm going to go for this. Because not often that kind of opportunity comes along. <laughs> Actually, not often. Never. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I just really went for it. And so actually now I've changed my mind about how I describe it. It's not an accidental book. It's a very deliberate book. Very, very deliberate. And so when they said to you, would you like to write a book, did you know what you wanted to write about? Like you'd written that first essay sort of accidentally? Yeah, I, I didn't. They want, I think initially, because I'd written the first essay about my relationship with my father, who's an alcoholic, and th I, they, I think they wanted a, a book along that, that, mm -hmm. those lines. You know, alcoholism is not a small or uncommon problem in Ireland, and they saw that as a, a way of connecting with readers. I, my dad already is large enough in my life without writing an entire book about him. <laughs> I was like, that's enough. Um, and... Uh, so I, I was literally on the bus on the way home from we, uh, my meeting with them, and I, it was part of the joke of the title, Notes to Self, I write on every little scrap of paper. Um, and I, had, I wrote down five ideas on the back of my bus ticket, and those five ideas were the other five essays in the book. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. And then it was funny, I was talking to close friends, and they, I said, oh, I think I might be writing a non-academic book. And they went, oh, ooh, a novel, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I went, oh, no, a collection of essays. And they all went, ooh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So not exactly. academic. And, then, and, and actually, and Tram Press, so there are multiple editions of this book now with different publishers. Tramp were the only people who would put essays on the cover. Right. Yeah, Pickard, Pickard didn't want the word essays yeah. anywhere near the cover. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so on other editions, what's on the it's cover? Just, it's just, just like that. that. Just oh, like that. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Because essays kind of like taboo or something, but, or scary, yeah. or God forbid. Maybe in other places, but then again, as, as Emily and I keep saying that we get, we're both constantly getting asked when we do events together or separately, you know, can you talk about the rise of the essay in Ireland? And, and there are loads of different reasons for it. Um, but it's a very nascent and new kind of form is, here, but there are yeah. lots of people I interested in learning about it or writing about it or people seeing that it might be a way that they could tell a story by using it who don't want to write novels or are not yeah. poets. Um, and I love yeah. them as a reader, yeah. right? I, yeah, I really love, in the same way that I like short fiction, mm. it sounds like a terrible reason, but I have a, sometimes a finite space of time that I can spend reading. And you can read yeah. an essay, and very often essays are thematic where they've got single focus. And as a result, you feel like you have spent some serious time on that theme within that essay. And you, no, you don't know about someone's whole life, but that's the point, right? That's, that's okay. And so there's an intensity to them, an intensity of experience with them, but also there's a lightness as well, because you're not spending 400 pages mm -hmm. reading about one thing. You're, you're, it's, it's, it's much more finite, much yeah. more complete. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I would like to ask you about that as well, because it, was this, you, you were an academic, and I, so I'm, you've written a lot of academic writing. Yeah. So what was the experience of writing in, in this kind of essay form, which is non-academic, but still brings a rigor to it? How did you find it contrasted? I love that you use the word rigor, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, um, because that is what I, I wanted to do, that combination of deeply personal writing that is very close to how I think, how my thought process works, and it was really liberating for me to then not have to turn that into this objective analytic voice. Um, but I still wanted it, I wanted every word to be considered, and uh, the process of writing the book was really, super, was really fast. I, so I often say it kind of poured out of me, but that was really the first stage of it. So I spent as much time editing the book as I spent writing it. And that, I think, is what, that, that was the process that really transformed it from a first draft into something that I was happy for people to read. Again, this is something that I had a conversation with Ronan um, where we would say, 
if, because it, the book is about a lot of things that I would never dream of saying out loud, <laughs> right? <laughs> really personal things I had never told to anybody before, kind of best friends who didn't know some of the things about me, which, again, is, is a little bit hard then to say, oh, I wrote a book. <laughs> you know? um, you've known me for 20 years, but you don't know this stuff. Uh, it had to be worth it as a result. And so I, I wanted to make it the best piece of writing that I could. And, and often part of that process, was, part of that editing process was cutting. Cutting is really liberating, I discovered. If you're like agonizing over a sentence and trying to make it work, just delete it. <laughs> and the problem is gone. And uh, I mean, I'm saying that with a smile on my face. At the time, it was not funny. Um, but it became, it became, I think, a much tighter and shorter um, book and yeah my hope is that then it's less because some of the experiences that I talk about that I write about are difficult it becomes less overwhelming if it's not if, if, if the description is paired back yeah 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 and what about you Sinead obviously your background is well, originally as an arts writer arts mm. journalist obviously that's very different to journalism and yeah. um, maybe you could talk a bit about finding your way into the forum I suppose of the essay yeah, I mean, sometimes I think being a journalist is the worst thing you can be if you want to be a writer. Um, and yet it's good for deadlines. You learn about words, shape, editing. Um, and I, I agree that Emily, I mean, I'm teaching a workshop this week and I, a lot of, I talk about a lot about concision and accordion your work. And it's, it's always going to be better because it's shorter, not because it's longer. Um, take things out as opposed to adding things in. Um, and I tend to throw everything in, into pieces and then take things out. And I talk a lot, a lot about that, that first grant piece, the first version of that piece. And this is, again, comes from people ask me a lot about being afraid to write about yourself. It'll be boring, be narcissistic. It, it won't be interesting. Who'd want to read that? Who'd want to read my story if I want to write, if anybody in this room is thinking about that? And the first version of Blue Hills, was, which is about a, a, a story of going to Lourdes when I was uh, a teenager because I spent four years in hospital having loads of surgery, having terrible things happen, having doctors not listen to me, have people cut me up with unnecessary scars that I still have, etc. Um, but it's about faith and loss of faith and going on a kind of pilgrimage. But it's also a lot about the church and the medical world being two very patriarchal worlds who don't have a lot of time for women and don't listen to women. Um, and the first version of it, uh, which a friend who's a first reader read for me, it, it was so much more big, political, dogmatic, and there's a tiny little story of me and the girl and coaches in the middle of it, and she's like, what are you doing with all this stuff here? It's religious stuff. We all know that story. Everyone knows that story. There have been big reports about those stories. No one knows this really interesting, small little story of yourself. And she said, you're, you're afraid. And I was like, yeah, I am. I actually am. I'm afraid of putting myself at the centre of this story, and I, I, I'm using these big totemic pillars of uh, politics and religion, the church and the state of Ireland, and what's happened to women in 20th century Ireland and beyond to hide behind. So she was like, get rid of all this, cut, 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 cut. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> God. And, and it's really terrifying because it's yeah. very exposing and it is very exposing, yeah. as we, we both know, to write, to write about yourself. And yet, when you do write about yourself, what happens is then people find, um, I remember John, John Updike reviewed Maeve Brennan for The New Yorker and said that the reason why her work was so brilliant is that there were moments of recognition in it. And I think if you write work like this, people see moments of recognition. They might have had the same, situations as me or as Emily, but they find different parts of the book to relate to and go, I feel that, I know what you're trying to say, and I'm glad that you said it. And that's been one of the, the joys of writing this. A really unexpected thing I didn't expect was to have that kind of connection with people. Yeah. Um, and it is, that it comes back to the idea of like in the essay having a moment or the rise of the essay. It is a lot to do with Ireland being a country where things couldn't be said and everything was whispered and someone went into the other room to talk. And especially if you're talking about family lives or family problems or alcoholism or women's bodies or illness or terrible things. It was like, don't talk about that and certainly don't talk about it publicly. And I think because Ireland has changed so much and we're having those conversations, it's, a, it's about an articulation of things that haven't been said and weren't allowed to be said and we're deeply shameful to say and they're not anymore. And I think that's where it comes out of that, if it comes out of anywhere in a way. Yeah, I really yeah. like, sorry I'm yeah. butting in here, but yeah. I really like that then negotiation between writing and speaking, right? So yeah. for me, lots of the things that, as I said, I would never say out loud, mm -hmm. I have been able to write about. And there's something about that very private and intimate relationship between you as a writer and then the page, a blank page, which can be terrifying at the same time, um, that allows you the privacy and the space and the quiet and the yeah. being left alone, yeah. Yeah. that you can write the thing. And then actually being able to speak about it yeah. follows. Yeah. afterwards. Yeah. 
And, and, and like, like you, that unanticipated part of that for me was that I was thinking, well, this is an incredibly vulnerable making, but also empowering thing for me to do. But then to see that reflected in people yeah. who have talked to me then about their stories, having read notes. And, and I have also, I think I have realized something about reading as well, that we read so much of ourselves into what we're reading. So the, a text is, is co-made by a reader. Um, the, and that's a real relationship, I think, that happens between the reader and the writer that I had only ever understood as a reader yeah. previously. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I don't know about you, because again, when you publish a book, you find readers, but I, I don't know how you felt when you were writing your book, but I couldn't think about the reader when I was writing it, because I wouldn't have written it, because I would have been too afraid. Someone's going to read all this personal stuff. <laughs> I, I would have been too afraid to write it, so I didn't yeah. think about the reader. And then when your book does come out, and you find readers, finding readers is really humbling and gratifying, and then you hear other people's stories, which is always yeah. is yeah. one of the, yeah. the kind of yeah. nicest parts of it, in a way. I think if I had been, I know, in fact, yeah. when the moments when I thought about someone reading it, I started, the narrative, st the voice started to shift and become like I was trying to please somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I had to forget about a person reading it so that I could write it honestly, you know, so that I wasn't steering it to be funnier or <laughs> smarter or more political or cooler or something. That thing that we're always doing, you know, in conversation with other people where we try and sell ourselves a little bit. And actually, you just really wanted, to, again, the joke of the title, Notes to Self. People say, did you write it for yourself? I'm like, yeah, no, I know, just to add to the narcissism. Right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I have no intention of reading it, no. Um, but, um, but, but you do, you have to, you have to forget. Well, maybe you'd like to read a little bit from this. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about never going to read it. <laughs> People said earlier, we'd never read your books again, but you have to read them at readings, but you'd never yeah, sit down and read it at yeah. home. Oh, and so then you remember, I don't read my sometimes book. you're reading and you think, wow, who wrote this? <laughs> um, this is, uh, I, I like to read from the very beginning of the book because this essay, which is called Notes on Intemperance, which is about my father, um, it was the first one that I wrote. And it's, so it all starts with this. By the time we find him, he has been lying in a small pool of his own shit for several hours. Corfu General Hospital is bewildering. The foyer is crowded with patients smoking, and there is no sign of an information or registration desk. I text him to ask where he is, but get no response. Somehow, like bloodhounds, we track him to the fifth floor. He lies weakly in the bed. It is evening now, and he says he hasn't seen a nurse or a doctor since midday. He says he needs a bedpan. My sister and I have been traveling for over 24 hours, and neither of us has slept. Call the nurse, I tell him. He says he did, but nothing happened. We'll do it again. He holds the call bell in his hand and presses repeatedly. After a while, a harassed-looking nurse appears, shouting at him, at us. I feel guilty for not speaking Greek. With useless gestures, I point to the man in the bed. I try to signal that he needs a bedpan to be washed and the sheets changed. None of this makes any impression. The nurse says something else, throws up her hands and leaves. He looks at us in desperation. I ask my sister to stay with him and I go out into the corridor. I can see only other patients and their families. I go to the nurse's station, but there is no one there. As I walk away at a loss for what to do, a woman speaks to me. When I don't respond, she asks me in English if I am all right, and I latch on, asking her if she knows where the nurses are. There are no nurses, she tells me. An older man leans over. Without your family here, you die. This will become a mantra to us during the time that we spend in Greece, trying to nurse our father back to life. Very quickly, we learn just how understaffed the hospital is. There are no doctors after 2 p.m. And after 5 p.m., there is only one nurse per ward, a ward they call the dying ward. The English-speaking local tells me that I must take care of my father. She explains gently where to buy incontinence pads and wipes and paper towels. I barely take this in, but go back into the private room my father's crisis status has secured him and explain to my sister the state of play. She looks at me in disbelief. She is standing at the head of Dad's bed and fixing his pillows. 
I realize that I have hardly spoken to him, though I have traveled across Europe to be here. You're alive anyway, I say. He nods. He looks very small in the bed, small and lost. I decide that this can't be the way it is. There must be someone in authority somewhere in this hospital. I go back into the corridor and ask the sympathetic woman if she will help me to find a doctor. She takes me down into the basement. Eventually, we find the blood donation clinic with its attending medic. I take his hand and ask him to see my father. I tell him that I don't understand, that my father is alone in a room and there are no doctors. I tell him that we just need someone to explain it all, that what I really want is someone to tell me what to do. The jolt of adrenaline which propelled me this far has suddenly gone and all I feel is empty. I just keep standing there, asking the doctor to come to see my father. Extremely reluctantly, he says something to the woman at the desk and leaves the clinic. We take the lift back up to the fifth floor, retracing my route past the doleful visitors and into the room. He's a doctor, I say, with more hope than certainty. He takes Dad's chart, looks it over, nodding, then says, your father has lost a lot of blood. It seems easier to agree, though I had hoped for a more thorough examination. In the weeks that follow, this will be the pattern that our time takes. Hours of waiting, followed by a struggle to attract official attention, only to be told something that we already know. After years of teaching Beckett plays, I am finally living in one. <laughs> Thanks so much, Emily. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to ask you both a little bit maybe about, um, well, we were talking about themes and we were talking about um, sort of getting to the self, I suppose. But another thing that's quite interesting in terms of the essays is the kind of the shape of them um, in, you know, each of them like um, has their own individual shape and they're the, the, the voice, I suppose, of the writer. Like your voice there, I know this was the first essay you wrote, actually, but it feels it feels very d direct. I don't know if that is a good word to describe it. Um, and did you find it hard to find that voice again? I know you're coming from an academic background, so it's very kind of different in some ways, the writing. Yeah. It's, it's funny when people say voice, because again, in that first um, meeting with Trump, they said, we love your voice. And I just said, I don't, I don't, I don't have a voice. Um, and then I realized through talking to them that they meant my voice. And that's what I try to... I know it sounds ridiculous. Say, I don't have a style. It's just what it sounds like in my head. Um, that is actually the purpose of style, right? Is to try and get something that sounds like you onto the page. And if I had difficulties writing the book, it was any time I tried to sound like someone else. So writers who you, I really admire... Um, from Megan Dawn to Nula Ofuelon to Rebecca Sonnet, kind of these amazing uh, women life writers uh, that I tried then to emulate. And I figured out eventually that I could be a third-rate Rebecca Sonnet or I could be <laughs> actually Emily Pine. And luckily, I chose to be myself. But I think that sense of directness, and for me as well, Sometimes people say like, it's a very emotional book, as in it's about emotional things, but I try not to feel the emotion on the page. I try to describe the events and my emotional reaction to them, but not describe the emotion endlessly. And one of the reasons for that is because as a reader, I don't like when people do that to me, because I feel as a reader, it doesn't leave very much space for you to have your own emotional reaction. And so when people say, oh, it's very... Um, unemotional, or it, sometimes it's not that complimentary what people say. Like, she doesn't seem to feel very much. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I do have feelings too. Um, and, uh, but that's actually deliberate, right? To not crowd the page with my emotion, uh, but instead to just try to describe it as accurately as possible. And I think actually maybe that does come from an academic training background to try and be unobtrusive, even though it's about me. Yeah, yeah. And what about you, Sinead? Like, your essays, um, 
in some ways they're quite different um, in terms of the form. You know, there's some that are longer, some that are shorter, and some that are, I suppose you might call them experimental, for want of a better word. Um, uh, why, how did it, how did, it, how did they turn out that way? <laughs> like, did the theme suggest the form, or were you interested in playing about with form? How did it work out? Yeah, I, I think completely. Uh, I, I'm also a big fan of Rebecca Solness, who has never written about her own life, and then I found out last week she's got a memoir coming next year, <laughs> who describes her own work as anti-memoir, which will be interesting to see where that memoir goes based <laughs> on that. Um, so I, yeah, I had a kind of an, an, an allergy to memoir, because to, to me, and the thing is I, I love memoir, and I love memoiristic writing, but for a long time memoir has, a, has, a, has had a, a stereotype. It starts at the start and it ends at the end, and it's a whole life, and it's straightforward, and it's chronological, and that's all the way you can do it. And I wasn't interested in that, because loads of parts of my life are not that interesting. And you do pick out bits of it and select stuff. So, uh, and because I'm, I, I'm interested in chronology, I, I like a lot of experimental writers, and I think because the essay, I think it's a very bendy sort of form, more so than novels, more so than short stories, even more so than poetry. I think it's very malleable. You can knock it into all sorts of shapes. You can kick it around and do lots of things with it. And then sometimes, I, I've, I've talked a lot about form is content and content is form, and that sometimes there's only one way to tell the story. So the book does end um, with a piece about my daughter that's written as a kind of a, a poem. And I mean, writing is really hard. There are pieces in this book that the, our mutual friend which took me over 10 years to write because it's difficult because it's about people that I know, um, someone who's dead, but I'm still very good friends with their, their family. Um, and that took years. And then the non-letter thing, I think I wrote that in about you know, it sickens me to say like 40 minutes one afternoon after like my daughter coming in from school one day. Wow, it's so good. And, and it's just, but, but that is the only time that'll ever happen to me in my whole life. Everything else is like years of sweating away and blood <laughs> and toil and horribleness. But sometimes just a, 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 something, so for, for example, there's, a, there's an essay about blood in this book, which is about an experience of leukemia, but it's also about the history of blood, the etymology, blood artists, performance art. And it's a really long piece. And again, reading really long pieces with lots of information can be very dense. So I wanted to break that up. And the most obvious way to break it up was to break it into the eight groups of blood groups and rhesus. So it's A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative. Because also the thing about essays is that you can, unlike novels where you have to follow a certain trajectory and things have to meet up and their plot has to work, and you can skip around and change tack all the time by just a carriage return, an asterisk, a new thing. You can mess around with the form and it's a great way of jumping around in loads of different topics. So some of the pieces in the book I, I didn't kind of go, this will be a poem, this will be an experimental. There's another piece that is based on a structure, it's about pain, and it's based on the McGill Pain Index, which is a real thing. A Canadian doctor at McGill in Canada came up with 77 words in 20 groups, and you're meant to select different ones, and you'll end up with the diagnosis of your pain, which sounds great, but then pain is a very singular, individualistic thing, and you know, if everyone in this room has a pain in their leg, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to last at the same time. We're not going to all feel the same. We won't describe the same way. Also, these words all came from doctors, not from patients, the people who are not articulating the problem. Which, so I'm interested in the inarticulation of pain. So I use that McGill Pain Index. And this is the, it's a piece in the book, in a book that is not known to be comic. Um, people say it's kind of funny, because it was a way to be playful. So in that way, messing around with that form and those words, you could be funny and playful and kind of mess. So I did deliberately do that, because um, yeah, there's a lot of big subjects as there are in, in Emily's book, in, in, in this book. And, and you're saying there like that you can sort of break it up and go off in different directions. Yeah, yeah. And you do that quite a bit, like that blood piece you're talking about, it goes mm. into the work of various artists yeah. who deal with blood. And then there's another uh, piece, uh, The Wound Gives Off Its Own Light, where yeah. you talk about Frida Kahlo and other yeah. artists. Bar borrowed, as well. borrowed from Anne Carson. And so I'm just interested in, in why you wanted to go down those avenues as well. Like I suppose you could suggest maybe it's a sort of an opening up of the theme. Yeah, it's a way of not telling a straightforward story. Um, because none of our stories, even the way if you, if you go out of here and you go to the pub with your friend and you tell them about your day, you're, not, you're, you're, you're going to be interrupted or you're going to change tack or you might embellish or restitch it a little bit. So we tell stories in different ways. And I think that there's a lot, uh, the essay form and then this, I, I'm interested in writers who are kind of hybrid sort of writers, people who don't write one thing or things that might look like a bit of a poem or a bit of an essay or a bit of a memoir. Um, and I didn't want it to be straightforward because, again, it's that idea of resisting the idea of telling, st telling a straight chronological. Also, memoir suggests to me that, you know, I mean, I'm not 85 or nearly dead, <laughs> so I, I just kind of went, I don't want to write about a whole life, so why would I write it in the same kind of chapter one, chapter two? So it's about that as well. Yeah. But I also, it's about 
when you're dealing with difficult, heavy topics, you can be kind of playful if you mess around with how you present them on the page. Yeah, I think. yeah. There is a kind of a lightness in some weird way. Thank, <laughs> thank God you said that. Great. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like we have been talking about the, the blood piece, and both of you actually have pieces about blood in your books, which are quite different. Um, um, maybe you could read a little bit from your blood piece, actually, sure. Sinead. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very... Somebody asked me today in the, in the workshop about how, how long can an essay be, and they can be as long as you want. And yeah, this, the original version that? of this was, it was 8,000 words originally, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but it's, it's shorter than that because yeah. I'm always hacking away at things. Um, even when I read from things, uh, it's still, <laughs> Zadie Smith was, is, 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 is generally always here at this festival, and she said the best time to edit your book is 10 minutes before you go on stage and read aloud from it, yeah. um, <laughs> which I tend to agree with. Um, so, you, yeah, and you'll see I've lines scratched through all this where I <laughs> chopping away. Um, so this is from the A negative section, and it's kind of, um, it tells a little story about one of my experiences with blood. If you take all the blood vessels in an adult body, veins, arteries, capillaries, and lay them out in a continuous line, they're said to measure 60,000 miles. Typing these words, fingers, depressing keys, there is movement of tendons across a pale landscape of skin. But what I notice most is the blue of the veins. Every slim stream, each a messenger of blood, working away unacknowledged. And over the years, several cannulas have been attached to my arms, pre-surgery, or when the veins at the elbow collapse like a coal tunnel. Each time a phlebotomist offers words as preparation, but they are never the right words, always inaccurate about the sensation that follows. You'll feel a scratch, or a nick, they say. It feels like neither. In my late 20s, six months to the day since I married my husband, I found myself in an ambulance on a cold, glass-clear January morning, a paramedic holding me upright because it was too painful to sit or lie on a stretcher. Later in the hum and chaos of the hospital, I was told that something of concern lurked in my blood. I hadn't suspected there was anything wrong until I found I could not bear any weight on my right leg. The throb and sear of it continued, and a doctor dispatched me to casualty, where I waited on a trolley in a tiny room beside two old ladies. That I was stationary for 72 hours now seems terrifying, given that the eventual diagnosis was DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Anticoagulants were administer administered in elephantine doses, and weekly visits to a warfarin clinic followed, an airless room where I sat among old women, a sea of silver heat-treated hair, the youngest person by decades. Warfarin comes in a trio of strengths and colours, Pink the strongest, followed by blue, then brown, but no matter what colours I took in rainbow combinations, my coagulation level bounced around like a skimmed stone on water. A persistent cough percolated in my lungs, and one day I woke to find my legs dotted with black bruises. Not just a handful, but more than 20 mottled circles. They weren't trauma inflicted, so they didn't hurt, and I now know that this phenomenon has a name, ecumosis, from the Greek and New Latin, to pour out. The colour frightened me. It wasn't recognisable as anything from the usual bruise spectrum. Night sky, purple, pond green. Everything felt ominous. Night sweat smoked me constantly and it felt like there was worse to come. What was happening to me? With illness, there's always a sense of before and after. The before time when everything is bright and even keel and normal, a word that loses all, face, all meaning in the face of disease. The final moments of before, just as it slowly dawned on me that bad news was coming, was when a haematology registrar, kind, blonde, about my age, used the word blast. Her reference wasn't to having fun, or Star Wars gunshots, or a wind that cuts you in half, but to Milo blasts, immature white blood cells that spill out from the bone marrow. This was a new word, and used in a medical context was enough to ping the synapses to make me ready myself. I fished for answers, dropping a line into this new, terrifying water. The haematologist was circumspect, eventually admitting there was an irregularity in the bone marrow. Like leukemia, I asked. And in that moment, I do not know where that question came from or how I made such a leap from bone marrow to cancer. But what did I know in this land of before? To be an undiagnosed patient is to be in a constant state of fear, of waiting for the revelation of offering hazarded guesses as an attempt to compute or to accelerate the truth. And on that Sunday, it felt like weighing up the facts of my body. The black bruises and night sweats and chest heaving cough were coming from somewhere. Thanks, Sinead.
I don't know how you write about something so beautifully, <laughs> but so, so hard. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, because Emily, I mean, I think I read a quote from you that said something like, I wrote the book I wanted to read or I needed to read. Yeah. Would that be the, yeah, yeah. So, like, when I think about your work, um, sometimes I think about that quote from the writer, Chris Krauss, and she talks about who gets to speak and why. Um, and it, it seems to me that in these essays, there's a lot of the 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 it's not permission to speak, but you are getting to speak about stuff that, that like you said there, Emily, doesn't necessarily always get spoken about. Um, and is that something that, I don't know, that you, you feel is valid, I suppose? I think it is. I said that line particularly in relation to, I wrote in the book about the years that we spent trying to have children and not being able to, and that was a really lonely, an incredibly lonely place to be. And I was reading, I was reading everything from kind of medical textbooks to try and, you know, work out what was wrong with me. Um, I was reading kind of blog posts and anything I could get my hands on that I thought might help. And yet nothing seemed to dispel that loneliness because I never came across somebody telling a story that looked really like mine. There were quite a lot of published stories of IVF journeys, but they all seemed to have a baby at the end of them. <laughs> They all had this happy ending. And so I ended up, right, I don't have the, the traditional baby version. I wrote my own happy ending. And so I felt like I was writing the book that I needed to read at that time. Um, but I also recognize, because a lot of people have said to me, I would never do what you have done. Write about that, those very private experiences. Um, and, and I say, well, you don't have to, it's okay. <laughs> I didn't. Um, and say, if I thought about it, I probably wouldn't have done it either. <laughs> um, but that's the kind of comic version of actually the serious underlying thing, which is often the reason we don't talk about things, we, there are social silences and there are taboos around the things that we feel we can say out loud. But sometimes it's just because it's emotionally too difficult. Silent, we stay silent for lots of reasons. And some of them are very good reasons for keeping ourselves safe and the people that we love around us safe. And so breaking that silence is, uh, is something that only a few people are, are going to have to do in order for other people to be able to read it or to be able to um, talk about it. I know people who have read notes, for example, and as a result, given it to their family members and had conversations around alcoholism, but around my dad as opposed to their dad, mm -hmm. as a way of bridging a kind of a, a silence that they can't break. Because in writing this book, my family has been incredibly supportive um, and, and given me permission in a different way. And we, are, we have more honest relationships now that the A word is out there, for example. <laughs> Um, but I broke something by breaking the fiction that we all lived by, which was that we were all okay. And you, I think you, that is a, an act of violence. And so I think sometimes silence is not a bad thing um, and because it can be protective. Um, you don't have to break it. Other people can. And then as a result, you can feel that pressure has lifted off you. That's, that's a kind of work in progress in my head at the moment, but I do think I wrote the book for myself, but it, that doesn't, have to, doesn't mean that everybody needs to do the same sort yeah. of confrontational thing with their voice. Mm -hmm. And were you thinking the same? I mean, it's obviously very different, but you have that essay called Notes on Bleeding. Is that... Again, this sort of <laughs> breaking of taboos, yeah. I suppose, really. Yeah, it was. And that was an essay that was going to be the political kind of manifesto <laughs> of my book, where I was not going to write about myself, I was going to write about women, right? In like with a capital W and an inverted commas and all the rest. And I kept trying to do it, and I kept thinking, actually, I didn't. I kept thinking it was fantastic. I was like, wow, <laughs> um, this is going to, you know, like really be, be feminist with a capital F. And my partner kept going, Realistically, Emily, though, other people have written this before. <laughs> and, uh, no, he's, he's amazing. <laughs> and, but he was saying, you know, you don't sound like you. And actually, what you have to say is a bit different. And that was the essay that changed the most because it, it came back to the self. I kept, it was a bit like you were talking about. It is terrifying. I kept trying to push Hiding. it away because yeah. I didn't want to write about my 
my body. I can, I, it's easier to write about other people's bodies, yes. you know? Yeah, and I yeah, didn't yeah. want to bring the politics home to myself because that would be really hard mm. and would personalize it. And as someone who has a history of eating disorders, I don't really like talking about or thinking about my body. Mm. And so actually it became the kind of the brave essay in the book was to say, okay, I'll make this about me. Wow. Okay. The, the thing that happens with, with when you write work like this, and it's always prefaced by personal, and particularly if you're a woman, your work <laughs> will be called personal essays. If your man writes essays, it will not be called personal essays. <laughs> yeah. These are just you really essays. grapple with the important <laughs> issues of the age there, oh, man. No. We got another hour. Um, it's universal. But it, but it is that I, idea that if you, you are saying things that people need to hear, and also, again, I say all the time that essays are, are not singular, they're, also, uh, they're about a lot of different things. And there is this unsay unsayable kind of quality to them, and th there is this kind of feeling that something has to be art articulated. And often it is about, so even though Emily's writing about her life and I'm writing about my, my life, the, the amount of people who then respond to is in a kind of a weird panoramic thing where you get people respond to different parts of different essays about different things, and they will never have had my life or Emily's life, but they still connect to it in so many ways, which is what the unit, which is what our essays are trying to do. They're writing from the personal to try to make it universal, and that is what they do. That's why they, they work, and what, that's why people connect, because they find something w within your work. And, and from the other point of view, that, so there's a lot of medical parts of this book, and I've had a, so I've had a, I talk about bad doctors, and doctors not listening to people, and not listening to people's pain, and not listening to me as a child, or women, or women in childbirth, or elderly people, or carers, or whatever it is. Um, because everybody has a bad doctor story. Everyone's been condescended to by somebody who didn't listen to them or was just missing them or rushing them out of the waiting room or whatever. And everybody's had that. And so it's my experience, but it's happened to so many uh, other people. And again, it's just that it's, there's a, a, an, an artist who's a very well-known Irish artist who wasn't well, who said that she'd had cancer. And she said to me, I, I wish I'd read this book at the time because I had a guy who was condescending to me when I was unwell. I'm thinking, what kind of doctor condescends to a cancer patient? I can't even imagine <laughs> what kind of person that is. But she said, I wish I'd been more, not even aggressive with them, but I wish I'd stood up to myself, because we, we have this deference around doctors. We think they're really important and, yeah. and special, and you know, South County Dublin, or whatever it is. And we just kind of feel that they know everything, and they don't know everything, because nobody knows your body or your medical narrative better than you. And they don't know everything, yeah. um, despite all, everything they do know, you know? So I, I feel it's a real, and everybody in this room probably has a bad doctor story, I'm sure of it. We'll, get, we'll yeah. take notes on the way out. Um, <laughs> for the next thing. book. For the next <laughs> You certainly yeah. have, yeah. you mentioned that as yeah. well. Oh yeah, I think, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. I think that yeah. we have had very different lives in it. Isn't it fascinating that hospitals figure, figure so really yeah. largely yeah. in both of ours? Yeah. And what really strikes me, whether it was that I was there with my dad as he was like in and out of intensive care. And I should also, the plot spoiler is he's still alive, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes forget to mention that, but, and, uh, but um, that whether it was with him or whether it was for me, it's, n it's bad enough that you're sick or dying or facing something that you don't know and are terrified of. Now you have to advocate for yourself as well. Now you have to be more assertive because if you're not assertive, you won't actually get the treatment and, and the you answers that you need. Yeah. You will not be heard, and it's excruciating. Um, I was at the doctor recently for something completely different, and I happened to mention being perimenopausal. And he was one of the, I'd never seen him before. He was kind of filling in for the usual person, for the usual doctor. And he went, I'm just going to stop you there. Come back to me in 10 years. Oh. <laughs> and then I could see him as he scanned the computer screen to check my date of birth, mm. because he did not actually said that based looking at me. He did not know how old I was, and he does not know anything about my body. And it strikes me, uh, again, I was in a room recently with a lot of male doctors, and I thought, um, you have all given smear tests, but none of you have ever had one. Mm. And I am the expert on, in this room mm. on smear tests. Mm. <laughs> and that, there's, um, there's, a, there's an essay in Constellations about hospitals and the kind of psychogeography of hospitals and weirdly I, when I was finishing the essay I ended up in hospital for two nights um, and it was a gyneco gynecological thing and I talked to uh, an Uzbek, uh, as I say in the piece, an Uzbek anaesthetist as this thing was going on <laughs> and he was talking about corruption and money and medicine and coming to Ireland and I said to a nurse later on, I said, there's a lot of men in, in gynecology and she was like, yeah, why do you think that is? And I was like, oh, I, 
is it? She's like, yep, yep, it's money. It's money. <laughs> it's one of the most highly paid. And that, again, is kind of an uncomfortable thing that the most amount of money that you can make is from women's bodies. Uh, yeah, so, god, yeah. Again, we need another hour. Yeah. 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 Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> now Listen, we're hitting the good stuff. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. I am conscious of time, however, yeah. so I'd like you guys, would you like to do a final reading each? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, okay, yeah. short, and we've been talking about blood, so <laughs> let's go for it. Go for it, Emily. <laughs> this is an essay called Notes on Bleeding and Other Crimes. <laughs> Famously, the trick to good writing is bleeding onto the page. I picture the male writer who coined this phrase, sitting at his typewriter, the blank sheet before him. What kind of blood did he imagine? Blood from a vein in his arm, or a leg, perhaps a head wound. Presumably, it was not blood from a cervix. I have so much of this blood, this period blood, this pregnancy blood, this miscarriage blood, this not pregnant again blood, this perimenopausal blood, it just keeps coming, and I just keep soaking it up, stuffing bleached cotton into my vagina to stem the flow, padding my underwear, sticking on the night pads with wings, hoping not to leak on some man's sheets or rip off too much pubic hair with a surprisingly secure adhesive strips. <laughs> Covering up with period pants, those unloved, dingy underwear choices pulled out from the back of the drawer every month. And all along, I was wrong. I should have been sitting down at my desk and spilling it across the page, <laughs> a shocking red to fill the white. Blood is dirt. Isn't that what the label feminine hygiene tells us? sanitary products for our unsanitary bodies. In fact, period blood is so dirty that it must never be shown. Instead, ads for tampons and towels demonstrate their absorbency with a bright blue liquid poured cleanly out of a laboratory beaker. <laughs> as a teenager, I did not recognize this sterile-looking fluid as like anything that had ever come out of my body. But then I wasn't meant to. That was the point. My body and its blood were taboo. And so the message is, blood is unknowable, blood is unshowable. As an adult, I still find it hard to say I have my period. Even within feminist conversations, some aspects of bleeding can be taboo. There is a current slogan that makes me laugh. A woman can do anything a man can do and do it while bleeding. But at the same time as laughing, I'm also wondering, what if I can't? Sometimes my hormones flood me, then leave me high and literally dry. Sometimes I am doubled up in pain. Sometimes even the idea of standing for any length of time leaves me feeling faint. I do not feel like a feminist hero in these moments. I feel like I want to go home and get back into bed. But in a world where women are still over-identified with their bodies, where women have to prove their intellectual ability over and over, what is the threshold for claiming this pain? If you have a headache, it's strained from too much thinking. I'm so brainy, I'm so busy. If you have a sore back, it's from overexertion. I'm so fit, I'm so active. A stress attack, I'm so hardworking, I'm so important. But a cramped abdomen, I'm so female. <laughs> It's unspeakable. For three decades, I have lived within a silence that declares periods too embarrassing, too unwanted, too female to talk about out loud. I have done this for so long that I almost no longer notice it. Almost. But now I am sick of the silence and the secrecy and the warped idea that blood is taboo when it comes out of a vagina because it is just not fucking good enough. To hell with covering up, with being embarrassed, with being silent. For most of my life, I have had a monthly period. For most of my life, I have smiled through PMT and heavy flows and cramps. And for most of my life, bleeding has been painful physically and emotionally. And so for the rest of my life, I will not be silent about it. I will talk it, write it, spill it. Blood will not just be my ink, it will be my subject. Thanks, Minion. So, Sinead, would you like to read? I think you're going to read the non-letter to your daughter. <laughs> 
by request from someone in my workshop. <laughs> um, the book, just as it starts with that, uh, me as a kind of young girl in Lourdes, it sort of ends with my daughter, and there's various things about being a mother and illness and thinking for a while that I wouldn't be because oh, my body just let me down an awful lot and things were not looking good for a long time. Um, but I am very lucky to have a son and a daughter. And I wrote this to my daughter because a lot of the things in this book, I write about a lot of women in this book, well-known and non-known and women who are in my family, my godmother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. Um, and I kind of wanted the book to sort of tilt towards the future because their lives were difficult and they're not the same as my life, uh, as, as privileged as my life is. Uh, and my daughters will be different again. So I kind of wrote it within the frame of like having a daughter growing up in a world where horrifying things happen to women and patriarchy still exists and all sorts of awful things happen. There was conversations on Liveline this week about catcalling, something that I thought had gone away a long wow. time ago. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a mini manifesto. It's quite short. Um, it's called A Non-Letter to My Daughter, Named for a Warrior Queen. I write this to you, daughter, place these words in your hands to help you understand the way the world will be because you are a girl. That chemistry and biology have colluded in your cells. That to some, your being is a reason to chasten, your body a warning, a toxin. How X or double X marks the spot, the target for what you cannot do or say or be. See, I write this to you, daughter, but I could write this to my son. But as Joe Jackson sang, it's different for girls. Your girlness, that unfairness, is an ongoing thing, that the world, when it tilts and spins, will push you away, and you'll be weighed up on the way you look, your size and your face, the space you take up, and if you put out or put up with things. Don't feel you have to smile just because someone tells you to, to cheer up, love, to, hey, I'm talking to you, to, hey, stuck up, bitch. Don't change if you don't want to, but change is a leap into the light. Chrysalis, hit and miss, I realize that don't is not a word we should direct at girls. Your lungs were the last part of you to work when you were born too early, but you sing and you sing and you sing. And if someone scorns the notes that you bend, the songs that you send out into the world, sing louder, be bold. Don't hold in your porcelain belly, skin smooth as an egg, like the ones you make me boil and only eat the yellow from. <laughs> hold on to your good friends, those bright boys and girls who light up when your name is mentioned. Don't try to make that girl like you. Don't fret when you are excluded. Jettison bad cargo, folk who talk out of the side of their mouth, those who go out of their way to avoid your good news who flash facsimile smiles when the world smiles on you, the people who are too afraid to try to do what you will one day do. Be a wanderer, a nomad, a rover, a roamer. Sail all the seas, be guided by stars, climb trees, talk to birds, sow seeds wherever you go, leave footprints in every city, kiss and be kissed. Find your sisters from other mothers, your Amazons and witches, believe in gods and monsters if you want to. Embrace heights, climb higher, cliffs and bridges are not to be feared. Your mountain breath can withstand it all. Grow flowers and wander amid pollen and petals. Never settle for what you don't want or love. Weigh the world up like a bag of water. Try to guess the weight of the life you want. Your peacock swoon and tiger spine, oh, your sea glass eyes. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. They are not the same thing. Don't worry about what will happen next. Assume there is goodness all around, unless there is not. And even then, be the goodness. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> um, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions, if there are any. And, uh, oh, we have a roving mic as well. So both of you were writing at a time when there was no pressure for a particular book. Um, so, you know, normally use that as the glory time until you've had the book published. Um, is there anything now that you've learned that will make you approach your writing differently? Um, you know, once the book's now in the public sphere, um, and the pressure completely changes as you write. Um, you both spoke about things that you learned as you were writing, like not trying to be like somebody else, and like moving the, changing the shape and the format and removing things. But is there anything you've learned 
going forward that will make your writing be different, do you think? I learned something really basic, which is that if you want to write, you have to sit down and write. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that hours at the desk add up. And the piece of advice which I took from a cartoonist called Jessica Abel, she has this phrase, she says, pay yourself first. And what she means by that is if you put writing at the end of your to-do list, at the, the thing that you do after you have fulfilled all your other obligations, whether they're work or family, whatever, you won't get to it. If you put writing at the top of your to-do list or your creative project, whatever that creativity is, you will do it. And that is how I wrote this book. And it's the only way to do it, actually, is to you, you make your life around the project of writing. I think uh, I used to be a music journalist for years, and they, you know, they say you've got your whole life to make your first album and 12 months to make your second. Um, and I think that I wish I probably had written more because when you do publish a book, and, and things get, get very busy in, a, in the most brilliant, uh, uh, humbling, uh, amazing way. Um, but it is very difficult to go back to it. And if you want to be a writer, I do think you have to, to write. And it's very easy to get this. I mean, I had a conversation with, with somebody yesterday about the fact that there's a handful of writers in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, who make a living from writing full time. Everybody has to do different things. So you have to make it the absolute priority. You have to turn it into a habit. You have to show up as regularly as you can. It can't be every day. I mean, Constellations was written by getting up at 5 a.m. a lot because I've always been freelance. I'm used to you know, not making a lot of money from things like writing. So, um, and then family and other... Also, the, the world crowds in. And I think Kevin Barry said that there's a seam of gold early in the morning before the world kind of notices that you're there. So before the admin, before the email, before the lunches, before the running around, before the things you get paid to do, it's a really good idea to, to show up and do it. So I'm, I'm, try, I'm getting, trying to get back to that now. But yeah, I, and I think also don't, don't think about... Don't ever try and second guess the reader or what people are going to say about it. And don't think about reviews or what people care. You have to write it for yourself. And it's great if it finds other people, but you, you literally can't put yourself too much. It, it, it is about being in a room on your own and with your own thoughts, and that is what it comes down to. Everything else is just distraction and politics, and for, forget it, I think. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Thanks. Hello? There? Yeah. Thanks. This question for you, Emily. Um, I loved your book. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And. It's kind of an obvious question, and you've partly answered it, the effect of revealing so many personal things about yourself. But I particularly wanted to ask about your students, because that felt like a really big risk and very sensitive area, because there's also a generation gap. And so I was curious about the, so the effect of um, that. We are, we are a day away from the book being out a year. Um, so it was published in July very deliberately, because I did not think that I could get up in front of a room of 320 year olds the day after I had just published stories about my own sexual history, for example, um, and give a lecture on, well, Beckett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and, then, and then I thought, well, maybe they won't notice, um, you know, that their teacher has published this book. And then, uh, and then it did really well, and everybody noticed. Because originally I, was, I kept saying to Trump, maybe we could publish the book really quietly. Um, the, they didn't do that. Um, the, but actually, the, I feared in the months before publication, not while I was writing it, but in the months before it came out, I feared being judged. And I feared being, especially in my place of work, not just by students, but by colleagues in the context. I feared that I had written about myself and my body, and as a result, it would no longer be seen as, intellect, as an intellectual, right? which is what we all aspire to be in that professional sphere. And none of that fear has come to pass. So uh, I've had students, and they'll come to my office hours, and they'll sit there and chat about, you know, can they have an extension? Yes. And, uh, <laughs> the, because timeliness and deadlines are important skills, but they won't necessarily learn them from me. And the, they learn other skills, right? And then they will still be sitting in my office, and I'll think there's something else here. And then they'll say, I love your book, and then pelt uh. out the door. <laughs> and, and then I think one of my favorite moments was when someone came up to me at the end of class, and she waited till everybody had gone out of the room, and she said, will you sign your book from my mum? And, uh, and just that, and apart from the fact that it's heartening that 18-year-olds still read books, 
Um, it's just been amazing to think of the generosity with which, and I'm sure you get this all the time, Sinead, as well, the, gen the generosity with which people read. People. And they don't read in order to then get information they'll use against you. They read in order actually to connect and to empathize. And that's been such a gift. There's one at the back there. Hi, Ra Hi Rachel. I work with Rachel. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, you were talking about the gynecological side of things, and this has been a bugbear that actually my partner pointed out, that they're called smear tests, like smear tests. And as he pointed out, the exams that men have aren't called the finger up the arse test. And I Good to know. <laughs> The things that you write about really push forward the dialogue of the way that women are talked about and the way that we talk about ourselves. And I'd like to know how much you've encountered from people coming up to you saying, thank you for pushing that forward and we need to continue. Because with things like Me Too or even in Me Too movement in the theatre in Ireland, in Dublin, it a big boom, but with only Michael Colgan. Yeah. Everybody else is on public forums. I won't mention names, but saying, yes, it's <laughs> terrible. And you're looking at them going, you MF, it's you. But we're still not raising our heads above the parapet, so how much more do we need to do that? <laughs> there <you go. laughs> Lots, I guess, is the really brief answer. I think there are a couple of parts to your question, um, one which is a, about language, and um, one of the things that I've realised is that, that you only take taboo or stigma or fear away from language by actually using it. And uh, my hilarious anecdote about this is that I was doing a reading in a bookshop in Edinburgh, and the, re the owner had read it, and she said, oh, so you're really, um, you feel really weird about saying the word period out loud. And this was one of the first readings I'd done from the book. It was last summer. And I was like, yes, <laughs> thinking, where is this going? And uh, she got the whole 50 people in the bookshop to chant period 12 <laughs> times. Don't worry, we're not going to do it now. <laughs> But, and I thought as we were doing it, because I was mortified, um, I thought as we were doing it, I thought by the end, for the 10th time, we're all rousing chorus of period, I thought I will never be afraid, I will never be afraid to say this word out loud again. And I think so much of that has to do with that, with the emotional freightedness of certain words, because you're not just saying the word, you're saying, you're talking about the fear or the um, history or the wanting to hide that's behind it. And that's what you were talking about as well, Sinead. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's a huge uh, amount of inarticulation around the body and around pain and about medical words. And I talk a lot about medical words in the book because I'm really interested in them because I think we, we use euphemisms all the world. And, and lots of the words we use about parts of female, the female body and intimate parts of the female body are very derogatory, shaming, dirty, harsh sounding, very you know, harsh consonants sort of sounds. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And language, is, again, is, it's a way of, by, by saying it, and again, we talk, both of us are interested in saying the things that are unsayable. So by saying them, you make them not taboo. You make them sayable. You make them commonplace. You make them become a conversation. Um, and I think, oh, God, me too. We could be here for a really long time. There's a lot of issues and, and problems around that. But again, that is also about a different type of articulation, about speaking up. And women talk a lot about whis whisper networks, where some of those things start, where you kind of, do you know that guy? Did he do that to you? I know he did. Yeah, he did that. Do you know him? And again, there's a lot of those conversations. They happen in literary circles in Ireland as well, where there's different types of behavior that has been sanctioned and been talked about for, as being OK and acceptable for such a long time that, that isn't anymore. And even, I, I know in, the, in, in the, talking about this book, there, there are men I knew who are lovely, lovely men who have only kind of realized things about being a feminist or being a feminist ally or being kinder to women and being open-hearted when they have daughters. It didn't occur to them until they had daughters. And I found that reason, oh, great guys, but the guys who would make the sexist jokes or the rape jokes or be kind of a little bit, you know, off color about gender. And then they have, ch they have daughters. The next thing, they're all about marching all the time and the POV. <laughs> and you're like, woohoo, that's great. But it shouldn't have taken you having daughters to realize that, mm. you know? Being into the experience, mm. I suppose. Yeah. 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 Are there maybe one or two more? No. Yes? <laughs> Just one sec, actually, oh. so that everyone can hear it. I will say it again. Our book club chose your two wonderful books as our reading, and I did what I always do, which was text, text my four daughters to say, um, can anybody lend me? And mention the two books. 
And I got four responses almost within uh, return saying, Mum, they're not books to borrow. They're Aww. books to buy. <laughs> because <Aww. laughs> and really, the, the second bit was because you keep wanting to go back as we're doing into them. And I found that having finished them, I'm already on my second time round. So oh, thank no. you. Here, thanks, someone. Thank you. Thanks thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I actually said that to someone today. <laughs> um, well, if there's no more questions, we'll yeah. um, finish Don't up. Sign books. And yes, <laughs> we're around to sign books and say hi in person. Yeah, the two writers will be signing books um, next door. Next door, yeah. So um, they'll be there. And um, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you very much to our wonderful thank you. writers. Thank you. <laughs>